Well, good morning. It's good to be with you today, and I hope that uh, we have a great time in God's Word. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 28. You're familiar with this passage of Scripture. It's Jacob's ladder, his great dream that he had while he was on the run from his brother Esau. And uh, we'll, we'll cover some of Jacob's life out of this, but it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it too. So let me begin with a word of prayer. The band will come, and uh, then we'll be right back with you. Heavenly Father, thank you that we're able to come before you today and uh, just worship you and hear your word and study your word and be able to rejoice and, and sing songs that just bless our hearts as we worship. And we pray that you'll open our hearts and minds to the truths we need today. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress. You are my portion, you are my hiding place, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life, I believe you are the way, the truth.
Well, I hope you have your Bibles open to Genesis chapter 28. I'm going to read a bit of the story here, uh, but give you some background to what's going on. Jacob is on the run for his life. And, uh, and so he, he encounters God in a miraculous way. And, uh, every time I read this passage of scripture, I, I remember that little song we used to sing, uh, I'm climbing Jacob's ladder. I'm climbing Jacob's ladder. It, it was an old song and I don't know if children sing it anymore, but it's a good song. But let me re- begin reading in verse 10, Genesis chapter 28. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba. Now that's in the south of the Holy Land and he's going north back to his mother's people. North, which would be Syria today. And he says, and he went toward Haran and he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on, uh, on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. So he dreamed and these angels are going up and down this ladder, this ramp maybe uh, to heaven. And, uh, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. And he says, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Now he gives these promises to Jacob. Listen to this. He says, your descendants all shall also be like the dust of the earth, and you'll spread out west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And he says, and you and in your descendants All the families of the earth shall be blessed. So what Abraham has heard and what Isaac has heard, now Jacob is hearing. And he says, and behold, I'm with you. Notice these four promises. I'm with you. I will keep you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. He had a, he had this revelation and he knew God was in the dream. He knew God was actually speaking to him in the dream. And he says, and I didn't know it. And he said, and uh, the Bible says he was afraid. He said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, Bethel. This is none other than, none other than Bethel, he says. And this is the gate of heaven. So he rose early in the morning and he took the stone, he put it on his head and he set it up as a pillar and he poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name had been called Lutz, Lutz. He made a vow to God. Listen to this. He said, if God does what he promised to do and will keep me on my journey and give me food and give me uh, garments to wear. And if I return to this place, in other words, if God makes good on his promises to me, then the Lord will be my God. Jacob's not very strong in his faith, is he? And then he goes on to say, he said, this stone where I've said as a pillar, it's going to be the house of God. And then he says something very strange. And he says, of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to thee. Isn't it interesting? Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. And Jacob says, I'm going to give a tithe of all that I have to you. Right now, he doesn't have anything. But pretty soon, he's going to be a wealthy, wealthy man. So you know what's going on here. With his mother's help, Jacob deceived Isaac, his father. And he stole the blessing and the birthright, which would have meant all the wealth that uh, that um, uh, Isaac had, from Esau, his brother. Esau was the firstborn, but through their deception, uh, they got together. And, and so uh, they, 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 they plotted against not only Esau, but they plotted against Isaac. And so it's just a, kind of a sad thing. But Isaac kind of comes around and he says, look, I know your brother's mad. I know he said he was going to kill you. So you go north. You go uh, to where I found your mother. You go to your mother's people and find a wife there and be there until, uh, until it all, boils, uh, until all uh, blows away. And then I will send for you and I'll come back. But in the meantime, as he makes his way, you know he's afraid. You know he's in a mess because of his deception. And we, we find out as we read the Bible that, that Jacob is not a great person. He really isn't. He's a liar. He's a thief. And he's a schemer. And yet God has a plan for his life. He's not a perfect man, but God had a plan for his life. Isn't it, isn't it interesting? I think sometimes we believe that if we're not perfect in all of our ways, then somehow God can't use us, won't use us or anything. If we don't walk in a perfect way, if we ever mess up, if we ever go through a season of uh, sin or rebellion, that God is actually through with us. And yet that's not true at all. Even though Esau has put a death warrant on Jacob's life, God says, I have something for you. I I think it's interesting, these promises that he has. 
uh, he, he, he dreams and he dreams seeing these angels come up and down and up and down this ladder from heaven. And, and God reveals himself in that as if to say, I'm working on earth. I've got things going on around your life that you can't see and you don't know anything about. I'm fulfilling my purposes and you're going to be a part of that. Now, I think sometimes we think we're not a part of anything big that God's doing, but every life that God creates is a life that he intends to be a part of what he's doing in this earth. He intends to redeem a people for himself, and he has pledged this to Abraham. He's pledged it to Isaac, and now he's pledging it to Jacob. And none of those men, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, were perfect in all of their ways. They, they were faithful, but they weren't just great men. They, they didn't rise above everybody else. In fact, Abraham might have been the best of them, but he tried to give his wife away in fear when he was down in Egypt. And Isaac did the same thing. And then here we have Jacob, who is just a, a deceiver. He's just a man of the lowest possible character. He, he's just uh, self-directed. He's selfish in every way. And his mother has helped him to be this. And now he's in trouble with a death warrant on his head. And he's running for the first time in his life. He's out of the protection of his father. He's on his own, basically. He doesn't know what he's going to find in his future. And in the middle of all of that, he, he has this vision from heaven. God reveals himself and gives him these promises. He said, I'm going to be your God and I'm going to do certain things for you. I want us to unpack this a little bit so we can understand what God is really saying to Jacob. And then we can make some applications in our own lives because our lives aren't perfect. I don't know about your life, but my life isn't perfect. I haven't always been the best man I could be. And I don't know anybody who's perfect in every way. I know some people who are better than other people. And I know people who are worse than some people who are better. But, but I tell you, no one of us is perfect. And so that doesn't excuse us from living for the Lord or it doesn't excuse us for believing that God's got a plan for our lives. In the worst circumstances that we could ever go through, we need to understand what Jacob learns, that God's got a plan and a will for our lives. And if we trust him, he'll unfold that will for us while he does a number of things within us. So he's working on the outside, he's working on the inside to accomplish his purposes and use us for his glory to do just that. So first of all, we, we see where the Lord reveals. He said, I'm the God of the past. I, I'm the God of your past. Before you were even here, I am the God of Abraham and I am the God of your father, Isaac. And I'm going to be your God. Isn't that interesting? He's not asking Jacob to believe in him. He's saying, I'm going to reveal myself and, and I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be the God that you come to know and the God that's going to use your life and build your life to accomplish my purposes in this world. And it's going to be so great that as I intend to bless every family in the earth, I'm going to use you to be a part of that blessing. Wow. That's pretty amazing. So he says, first of all, I'm the God of the past. We need to remember that the God of the past is very important to us. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and Joseph, and Moses, and uh, Daniel, and David, and all that. Jesus and it, it came to reveal this God of the past, and he revealed it to Paul, and Peter, and John, and whatever. The God who worked in the past is still the God of today. And so that's the second thing that God reveals to him. He said, I am your God. I'm going to be your God and I'm going to bless you. And notice what he says. He says four promises beginning in verse 15. He said, first of all, I behold, I am with you. Now that's the God of the present. So he said, I'm the God of the past and it's in your lineage. It's in your family. But now I'm the God of the present. I'm your God right now in the circumstances that you face with this death warrant from your brother, with all your scheming and deceiving, and the fact that you're in a mess in your life and you're on the run for your life to a future that to you is uncertain, I want you to know I am right here. I am the God of the present and I am in your life right now. Isn't that wonderful to know? That no matter what, look, I think about this pandemic all the time, just like you do. And I think about the, you know, what's going to happen in the present? Am I going to get this? And people are uh, friends that I have have it. Some of them are in, in, in the throes of life, literally. And I wonder, and, and it's a reminder that God is saying to us, I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still the God of the present. I know what God's done in the past in my life. And I bet you do too. 
I, I, I bet you can recall things that God did in your life in the past that were just absolutely wonderful. They're a part of your life. They're a part of your testimony. And we need to understand that the God of the past is also the God of the present. He's right here with us. He understands what we're going through. Not just our pandemic. It could be a loss of job. It could be a family issue. It could be a marital strain. It could be a financial loss. God hasn't gone anywhere. He knows exactly what we're going through because he's going through that with us. And he says, I am here. Notice what else he says. And I'm going to keep you wherever you go. I'm going to protect you. Now, listen, if the goal of our life is just to live in this life, then we have the wrong goal. But the goal of our life is to live forever as we move through the travails of this world. Then God says, I'm going to keep you. I'm never going to let you not be alive with me. I'm going to give you eternal life so that even if we pass from this life to the next, we are still in the presence of God. He's always going to keep us. In this case, he's telling Jacob, I don't want you to be afraid because I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect you from Esau, and I'm going to protect you from any harm in the future. Now, you've made a mess of your life, and you've created circumstances in your life that you're going to have to live with and go through, but I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you in this. And notice what else he says. I'm going to bring you back here. That's a promise. Isn't it wonderful that he made this promise to him? He says, I'm going to bring you back to this land. I'm going to bring you back to this land, and I'm not going to leave you until I've done what I've promised. Two promises there. First of all, he says, I am going to bring you back here. I, you, you're meant to be here. I have a will for you in this land that you're running away from, and I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to orchestrate circumstances in your life that are above the circumstances that you've created, and I'm going to bring you back in this life. I don't know about you, but that is a great, great, can I say it again? A great promise of the Lord. Because we often create circumstances through our sins or our bad choices or whatever else, and they just seem to be overwhelming. And God says, I've got circumstances that are above the circumstances of your life. And guess what? As Paul says, I can make all things good, even of the mess you've made of your life. I'm going to do what I've intended to do, no matter the circumstances that you happen to go through. Jacob is going to go through many, many circumstances of his life that are not good. He ends up marrying the wrong woman. He, he's deceived by his brother, by his father-in-law. Uh, he marries uh, the woman he wants to marry, uh, Rachel. And yet, even, even then, he has to go through travail. He spent 20 years in a place where he didn't belong. And finally, he leaves. Laban chases him down. But God worked in all of that. And God was doing something. And we'll get to that in just a moment. And then finally said, I'm going to give you provision. Jacob leaves with a shirt on his back, so to speak. He's on the run with no provision and no prospects. He's going to a place. He doesn't know if he's going to be received or not. He goes to this place and he works 20 years for his father-in-law. And before it's over, he goes back to where he belongs in Beersheba, south in the south part of the Holy Land. And he goes back a very wealthy, wealthy wealthy man. God provided for him in circumstances that Jacob didn't want to be in. God provided for him in circumstances that Jacob had created for himself. And as he lives in these circumstances, despite all the obstacles that he had, God had a reason to bless him in his life and bring him back as a wealthy man, not depending upon his father, but depending upon the heavenly father, not depending upon Esau and whether he was going to kill him or not, but the protection that he gave him, both from Laban, his crooked father-in-law, and also from Esau, the one who was so mad at him. And so he gave him this provision. And then God says in this, I'm going to be the God of your future. I've been the God of your past, even when you didn't know it. I'm, the, I'm your God right now, and I'm going to do some things, and I'm going to be the God of your future. I'm going to bring you back to this place with my protection and my provision. Jacob, who doesn't know much about the Lord, Jacob, who's probably just living on the remnants of his father's faith, Jacob says, this place is awesome. I didn't know, but I'm in the presence of God. This is the very house of God. Now, he's not in a house, he's outdoors. But he says, this is the place where God is. God has revealed himself to me that he's working in this world and that I'm a part of that working that he's doing. 
It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So he responds with a confession and a promise. And he said, you know, if God, God, if you'll do all this that you've promised to me, you'll be my God. You, you will be my God and I'll give a tenth of everything you provide me with in the future. What a, what a great confession it is. Now I'm telling you, Jacob's not through yet. Jacob's character is not perfect. But he's saying, if somehow all of this works out, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to worship you. And he does do that. In the, in the future, in his future, he's going to be worshiping the Lord. He's going to be acknowledging the Lord, even though his life is not perfect. And it's filled with a lot of fear because what he's done in his life and what he's gone through in his life, he comes to say, Lord, I'll give a tenth. I'll worship you and I'll worship you materially. I'll worship with my heart. I'll trust you. I'll be my God. Listen, we need to understand a few things from Jacob's life. This is why I just love this passage of scripture. First of all, that ladder, which is really probably a ramp. You know, angels on one ladder would be kind of funny, but on a ramp here, let's just call it a ladder. Uh, these angels going back and forth, you know, are, that vision is there to remind us that God is always at work and the circumstances that he's working are greater than our circumstances because our circumstances might not be so good. We may be going through the toughest times of our lives, but God is at work to bring us to him, his presence on earth and his presence with him in heaven forever and ever. And God's got ministering angels to minister to us, to provide for us, protect us, show us the way. So many things that God has and that he uses to give us what we need. I think that's very, very important for us to remember. And then we ought to see that he is more powerful than our failures. I want to say that again. I want to say it very specifically. God is more powerful in his love, in his mercy, in his forgiveness. He is more powerful in all of those things than, than our failures. He's more powerful than our sins. He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us so that our sins could be forgiven and our nature of sin could be done away with. That's how powerful God is. That's how powerful the love of God is. We think of the love of God sometimes as gentle and, and, and we should, it is gentle and loving and it is. But his love is powerful, powerful enough to redeem us from our sins and keep us from separation from him forever and bring us to heaven when we don't deserve it and sometimes we don't even know about it and like Jacob, we not even, maybe we don't even want it. In our circumstances, he's more powerful than our failure. In fact, here's how powerful God is. He actually uses the circumstances of our sins and failures to do something in our lives so that we can be used by him to accomplish his purposes. He plans for us. And listen, even in our failures, in our sins, and in our circumstances that we go through, God does something that's truly remarkable. He builds our character. You know, God is about to use Jacob for great things, but he can't use him right now because he doesn't have the character to match the calling. God has a plan for your life and my life. And many times we can't see all of that plan as it unfolds because he's trying to build our character. And the only way God can build our character is through the stresses that we experience in life. Because through those stresses, we learn to trust him. In the tough times of life, you either walk away from the Lord or you run to him. And when you run to him, you find his power and protection, provision. All of those things come to bear and it builds our character. And instead of being afraid all the time, and instead of being selfish, we learn to trust the Lord. And in his grace and mercy, out of that faith, we become stronger. God is going to build the character of Jacob, but it's going to take 20 years for him to do it. He's going to have to go through more failures in his life and more frustration in his life. And yet God is working in his life day by day, year by year, not only to bless him materially, but to build his character. Some things that God would like for us to achieve we cannot possibly achieve because we don't have enough faith yet. We don't have character yet. We don't have the integrity that it takes. We don't have the boldness that it takes. We don't have the understanding and the discernment that it takes. That comes out of character. And the Holy Spirit works in our lives through these circumstances to produce so many things, love and joy and peace, but also the integrity of life and the sanctification of the life and the holiness that it requires for God to use us to accomplish whatever purposes. And you say, well, what are all those purposes? Well, we have many purposes. 
There's a purpose of God in the church that we have and our families, raising our children, loving our spouses, uh, being a good neighbor to people, working hard. All of those things require character as well as God's power in our lives. And so that's what we have. I want to remind us of something else. In the end, Jacob calls upon the Lord and worships the Lord, and he does wonderful things. He really does. But his past is something that he's always got to deal with. Well, let me tell you something about your past. Your past, even though it's affecting your present, is not your future. Your past is not your future. You see, God is powerful enough to take our past, past, and, and, and no matter what they are and how devastating they've been and no matter what the circumstances are and shape those things and mold those things and give us a great future. I love what, uh, what he said to Jeremiah. Don't you love, you know the scripture, but I want to read it again. Uh, he, he, God's talking to the children of Israel and he says, for I know the plans I have for you. God's got plans for you, declares the Lord that I have for you, says. It's welfare and calamity, not calamity, for a future and a hope. And he says, then you will call upon me and pray to me and I will listen and you will seek me and you will find me when you will search for me with all your heart. You see, ultimately, Jacob will have to depend upon the Lord. And when he comes to that point, his character is right and the plan of God unfolds and he becomes the, God, the man God uses to bring uh, the 12 tribes of Israel into being. And that is the beginning and the extension of the promise to Abraham to bless all nations because eventually from one of his descendants will come King David and from David will come Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And remember this too, the length of time that it takes for God to do what he wants to do in our lives is of no, uh, no concern to him. God's got time. He's eternal. We feel like we don't have time. I, I don't know where you are today in your circumstances. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe you've had an accident. Maybe you've, uh, uh, somebody's betrayed you. Maybe you're just lonely. Uh, maybe you're struggling, suffering, you're ill. Uh, maybe you're afraid of this pandemic. Uh, maybe you've just lost your job or maybe you're struggling financially or so. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Circumstances are, are tough for everybody right now. I want you to know that the God of the past who's always been faithful is with you and me right now. We can just say right now in our hearts, thank you, Lord. And I want you to know this, that the God of the present and the God of the past is the God of the future. He's not going anywhere until he brings to bear all that our lives need every day to build our characters, to equip us to serve him on this earth and be ready to meet him in eternity. That's one of the most wonderful things about this story of Jacob. You don't have to be perfect for God to work in you. In fact, none of us are perfect or he wouldn't work at all, but he works in our lives and works in our circumstances to shape us and to mold us to provide for us and protect us and to fulfill his promises to us. God has plans for us and that's for our welfare and for our good and we must trust him for it today. Let's thank the Lord for his goodness. Heavenly Father, we thank you that just like Jacob, just like in Jacob's life, who wasn't a sterling character. You can work in our lives. We have many sins and failures. We have many circumstances that press in upon us and we thank you, Lord, that you're with us just like you've been in the past, you're with us right now and you'll be with us in the future. You're not going anywhere. Father, thank you for that. Mold us, make us, shape us, do whatever it takes. And we trust you to do that and give us strength in these times that are so, so devastating and threatening. And we ask this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to this number from our band. I'll be right back with you. Thousand stories of why they think you're alive, but I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and he told me that you're pleased and that I am never alone. You're good. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, 
It's who I am I've seen many searching for answers Far and wide But I know that we're all searching for answers Only you can provide Cause you know Say a word, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are. Well, Jacob is one of my favorite characters, and I'll just encourage you to read about his life in Genesis. Uh, boy, he had a lot of ups and downs, but through it all, he became, uh, he became God's man and did a great work in ways that, I, I, frankly, I can't quite understand, but it's still good. Now, next week, we're going to look at Joseph. Now, listen, I know I preached on Joseph a few uh, weeks ago, maybe months ago, I don't know, but I want to go back to him because he's one of my favorite characters and give some more insight uh, to what it means to live in the ups and downs of life. So I'll see you next week. God bless you.